Namaste. I welcome you all to a special session today on World Cancer Day. The title of today's talk is How Can We Look at Cancer in Ways More Than One? The speaker, Dr. Ramesh Bijlani, is a prolific writer and an inspirational speaker who holds a master's degree in nutrition from MIT USA besides a doctorate in physiology from Ames, New Delhi. Once a professor at Ames, New Delhi, Dr. Bijlani is now a spiritual seeker at Sri Aurobindo Ashram, Delhi branch. Dr. Bijlani, sir, thank you so much for being with us today. Look forward to your session, sir. Over to you. Thank you, Arunima. I'm not a cancer specialist. Uh, as you might have picked up uh, when Arunema was introducing me. But I do know something about cancer. And uh, that can't be enough justification for my speaking about cancer. And that too on the World Cancer Day. But the reason why I chose to do so was because uh, I have certain things to tell you about cancer, which are generally not talked about. Even doctors don't talk about them. And uh, I hope uh, they'll be of some value at least some of you. So with that little introduction, let me turn to the slides. So cancer can be looked at in many ways, as the title suggests, and we shall see uh, some of the ways in which it may be looked at in today's session. Before I go further, the love and blessings of the mother and Sri Aurobindo to all of you. We'll start with, as you might expect any such talk to start with, uh, to begin with the biology of cancer. Our body is made up of trillions of cells and uh, most of these cells uh, keep dying, but then we don't uh, come to know about it because uh, the number of cells lost is exactly the same as the number of cells that divide to replace these lost cells. So cell death is as much a reality as cell division and uh, one keeps pace with the other. Not only are the cells replaced, the type of cells that replace the lost cells are exactly of the same type, which means that uh, they function in the same way as the cells that have been lost and therefore function also doesn't suffer. And uh, we remain blissfully unaware of this process going on. It's somewhat like uh, an automobile in which uh, uh, one by one different parts might uh, give way and then you change them, you put a new part there. So after 15 or 20 years, uh, the car might still look the same but many of its parts are not what we initially started with. In fact, uh, more than half the parts might have been replaced by new ones. Now, occasionally what happens is that uh, this precise process of uh, the cells replacing the lost cells does not go on too well because you can understand it has to be a finely regulated process. And once in a while, something can go wrong with this process. And uh, the cell division in some of the cells might become much faster than is desirable. And when they multiply very fast, they di divide very fast, then what happens is not only the number of these cells grows, but uh, also we find that these cells do not function like the normal cells. So uh, they are uh, an additional sort of mass that develops without actually being able to perform any useful function. And this is something which keeps happening perhaps all the time in each one of us but uh, we don't even come to know because uh, before this mass has developed into a full-blown cancer, it is uh, taken care of by the defense mechanisms of the body. And there are two types of defenses that save us from developing a full-blown cancer. One is that uh, while these cells are dividing, they also need additional nourishment. And this nourishment has to be brought by the blood vessels. And the blood vessels do not keep pace with the cell division. They do not form as fast as the cells are dividing and therefore these cells 
do not get enough nourishment and that's what starves them and uh, that's how the tumor is taken care of. Another thing that helps us is the immune mechanisms of the body. And uh, that happens because uh, the immune system works on the basis of self and non-self. It recognizes what belongs to the body, which we may call self, and what does not, and uh, that we may call non-self. So it distinguishes between the two. It's able to identify the cells that belong to the body and distinguishes them from those which do not. For example, germ cells, which, uh, the various germs which cause infections, when they enter the body, they do not belong to the body. They are identified as foreign and the immune system eliminates them. So that's what the immune system so basically works on. That's the principle it uses. Now these cancer cells, although they belong to the body, they are quite unlike the normal cells of the body. And therefore, these are also identified as foreign or alien to the body. And they are eliminated in the same way as the germs. And therefore, while the tumor is still very small, on one hand, it starves because the blood vessels do not keep pace with the cell division. And on the other hand, the immune system identifies these cells as uh, not belonging to the body and eliminates them. And therefore, we remain unaware of this type of process going on in the body and we remain, by and large, cancer-free. And therefore, you can understand that if the immune system is weak, then it might give a chance to these rebellious cells, you know, which are dividing very fast and dividing into cells which are functionless. Uh, these rebel cells then get a chance to proliferate uh, at a pace that uh, the immune system, the weak immune system can't keep pace with and therefore, it may develop into a full-blown tumor. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, what essentially we need for prevention of cancer is to take care of all those factors which strengthen immunity. And this becomes relevant also to the treatment of cancer, as we shall see later. So what we can do to prevent cancers is to strengthen our immunity. And immunity can be strengthened by physical activity, remaining physically active, eating the right type of diet in the right amount in the right way, and keeping away from alcohol, tobacco, and other substances of abuse, and uh, sleep for the right duration at the right time in the right way, and uh, above all, be at peace. Mental peace is a major sort of a determinant of the competence of the immune system. So you can identify here, in fact, just about the same lifestyle factors which apply to any other lifestyle disease. And uh, much of the illnesses today, which are killing man, are lifestyle diseases. Because infectious disease and nutritional deficiencies, which used to kill man once upon a time, have more or less been eliminated. And uh, therefore, the major among the major killers of mankind today is cancer and other lifestyle diseases. And uh, they're all rooted in uh, an unhealthy lifestyle of which mental Stress is an accompaniment and how the two are related, why uh, the new lifestyle also contributes to mental illness and how other factors contribute to mental illness. We do not, mental, not mental illness, but uh, being mentally under stress. So how all that happens, we'll not go into it, but you can identify these factors as quite something that you're quite familiar with. And uh, what is the way to stay mentally at peace? Uh, basically love. Because uh, uh, if we look at the nature of the mind, the very nature of the mind, which has two aspects, the feeling and thinking part, is that uh, it is normally not at peace. The feelings are uh, very volatile, whereas uh, the thinking part, the intellect, is normally vacillating. So with a volatile mind and... Uh, a vacillating intellect, how can we be at peace? Unless it is anchored to something which is itself at peace, and that is our soul. And to anchor the mind and the intellect to the soul, what we need is to change the way we look at the world, the way we look at life, and that can be done uh, only by the mind and the intellect working in light of the soul. So that's what anchoring means. And uh, when we do that, we find that we start making choices which emanate from love. Because uh, that is what uh, makes the mind and the intellect function in such a way that it ensures not only mental well-being, but lasting mental peace, 
which is independent of external circumstances. Because so long as our happiness is dependent upon external circumstances, which is the fact when uh, the mind is not sufficiently illumined by the soul, uh, we find that uh, so long as uh, the mind functions without sufficient illumination from the soul, it, our happiness remains dependent on external factors such as uh, uh, what type of food I eat, what type of clothes I wear, what type of a car I drive and our relationships what's my relationship with the, the spouse and the children and uh, at the workplace. Now, these are the type of factors which are all outside us. These are the factors which keep determining our happiness. And so long as our happiness depends upon these external factors, we cannot be at peace because uh, these are things which are subject to change. Life is never 100%. All these factors will never be perfect. And if occasionally for a brief period in life, they are almost perfect, will be nagged by the insecurity, how long will it last? Because these factors we know are highly vulnerable and can change in a moment sometimes. And therefore, the only way to get stable peace is for the mind and the intellect to be illumined by the soul. And that is what gives us that independence, that freedom, that liberation from external circumstances. And for that, one of the important things, most important thing is that we should be making choices in life which are based on love, which means realizing a sense of oneness, if not oneness, at least a sense of interdependence and interrelatedness with the rest of the creation. And when we do that, then we are not obsessed with our little self. We are looking beyond ourselves and uh, out of this love, we are giving to those around us uh, what we can give to those who need it. And uh, that is what gives us that peace, which in turn stimulates or rather increases the uh, capacity and the competence of the immune system. And that is the most important contributor to preventing cancer and several other illnesses, lifestyle diseases. So in fact, uh, in these uh, uh, 10 minutes or so, I conveyed the essence the most important things that uh, I have to say, but then uh, uh, I'm sure you may like to hear a little more. So we'll go on further. So now we'll talk a little more about the biology of cancer, a little in greater detail. Now, what is cancer? Cancer is a group of diseases. It's not a single disease because it can affect many organs and depending upon which organ is affected, it has different characteristics, different risk factors, different ways it manifests. So it's a group of diseases in which the common features of uh, irrespect of where the cancer occurs is that there's an abnormal, unregulated cell growth, which means the normal regulation, which ensures that the cell division is just as much as the cell death, that regulation fails. Secondly, these cells, abnormal cells that are produced at a very fast pace, the cancer cells, they have the potential to invade or spread. You know, they don't adhere to each other with the same uh, sort of tenacity as normal cells do. And therefore, they not only invade locally, have a tendency to uh, spread and invade local tissues, but they can spread also to distant organs, get detached and spread to the bloodstream or the lymphatics or both. Then, you know, they can affect any organ in the body and therefore there are in fact more than 100 types of cancer. Now, what is the age at which cancer is most common? You might guess that it is most common when the immunity is weak and that happens at the two extremes of age, uh, at a very young age, below 15 and when one is getting a little older, above 60. Below 15 because the immune system has still not fully developed. And after 60, because like all other functions, this function also starts deteriorating because some decline in all functions of the body is quite normal and natural in old age. But all the same, cancer amongst the elderly is much more common than cancer in children, which is good. And you can see in this graph how the uh, we have cancer in males and females. And this blue one is the male and the red one is female. And uh, you find that the uh, 
incidence of cancer goes up sharply after age 60. Here, you know, because of uh, the scale, you feel that it hardly occurs in young age, but all the same, that number, much, sm much smaller than the number above 60, is also not completely negligible, especially leukemias, etc., pretty common in children also. Now, what is it that causes cancer? If we go to the basic biological mechanism, majority of cancers, 90 to 95 percent, are due to genetic mutations, which means there's a change in the genes, and that is what leads to the unregulated proliferation. Because if we have all types of genes, some of the genes uh, promote division, and some of the genes prevent this type of abnormal division. So a sort of an imbalance between uh, the genes which may lead to cancer, which we call oncogenes, and uh, the genes which protect us, which we may call the tumor suppressor genes, broadly speaking. So there's an imbalance between the two. Uh, there is an overactivity of the oncogenes and an underactivity of the tumor suppressor genes. And uh, as you can understand, there are a large number of genes in both categories. So multiple genes are involved, but then some key genes may be involved. The key genes may be different in different cancers. And the result is that there is this unregulated cell division. So basic thing at the cellular level is a genetic mutation. Mutation is you know, a relatively quick radical change. And uh, what triggers this are various environmental and lifestyle factors. Now, how about the genes that are inherited? That is, uh, uh, is cancer therefore inherited? It's by and large not necessarily so. So which means that uh, it's not that the cancer is passed on, although the tendency to inherit some of the cancers may exist. So multiple genes are affected in uh, leading to this uh, uncontrolled cell division. And uh, that you can say is uh, due to the underexpression of the protective genes, the tumor suppressor genes, overexpression of the oncogenes, and formation of novel oncogenes. That is, there may be some new type of, because of uh, changes in the genetic material, some new oncogenes which did not exist in the cell to start with, they may be formed and there may be a failure of error correction mechanisms because these errors do occur and apart from the two factors that we talked about, that is uh, the blood vessels, formation of blood vessels not keeping pace with the cell division and poor immunity. Apart from that, what also protects us from cancer, from a full-blown cancer is that there are error correction mechanisms. There are mechanisms which control the errors of this type in the genes. So those error mechanisms apparently in these cases are unable to cope with the type of changes that are taking place or they may fail completely. These error correction mechanisms may fail completely. One of the important mechanisms associated with cancer is that there's a failure of apoptosis. Now, what is apoptosis? Apoptosis is uh, a, a cell death, which is uh, something, you know, which is programmed within the cell itself. The cell itself realizes when it is either uh, functionless or uh, not required anymore, it dies. So, this is programmed cell death and uh, that also is an important mechanism, mechanism in the body, uh, which uh, we need, as you can understand, when there is an unfixable DNA damage, for example. So when the cell undergoes some type of a defect, it the cell as if you know realizes that now I'm of no use to the body, so let me kill myself. So it is suicide by the cell. And I like this concept very much because uh, unlike us, our cells actually do not cling to life. When they feel that uh, now I'm of no use, they are willing to die and they are programmed that way. And here is the cellular mechanism shown of how the cell shrinks and forms these blebs and then ultimately disintegrates. So uh, if the cell, if this mechanism of cell death, programmed cell death or cell suicide is in good shape, then there is no cancer risk because if there's a uh, damage to the DNA, you know, all genes are made up of DNA. So if there is a genetic mutation, 
failure of the error correction mechanisms, any type of damage which we were talking about, then this cell is programmed to die. But then that doesn't, uh, if uh, that happens, there's no cancer. Whereas if this cell continues to divide, it clings to life, uh, then it could lead to cancer. Now, we have talked primarily about the lifestyle factors. How about the environment, environmental factors that can initiate or promote the genetic mutations that lead to cancer? In this category are some infections, and some cancers are clearly related to infections, like, say, the cervical cancer, and uh, the radiation. Radiation, you know, uh, different types of uh, uh, radiation now are plenty in the atmosphere. Uh, especially they have grown after uh, the after internet and the cell phones and smartphones, all that became common. Now these things have become a necessity almost. Uh, while they have done a lot of good, whether they are doing any damage remains uncertain, but all the same, the possibility exists. And uh, then pollutants, environmental pollutants, the air, the food, water, everything is polluted. And uh, we do not have much choice there sometimes which means that what we have to concentrate on is what we can change through personal effort. And in that, we primarily have lifestyle factors. We can't, if you have inherited a tendency to get cancer, that we cannot do anything about. So the genes that we have inherited are a given that we have to live with. And by and large, they are not the major cause of these lifestyle diseases. And also, none of us gets perfect genes. So therefore, we should not be blaming uh, our parents for what we get, by and large, what does uh, what we can do about is lifestyle factors, environmental factors. Again, through personal effort, there's very limited, uh, there very limited extent to which we can do something. But uh, what we can do about is lifestyle factors, and if we just take care of that, that can still be highly protective. So the important things are, once again, summed up here, low level of physical activity, poor diet, these are the lifestyle factors that uh, contribute to the genetic mutations, which in turn lead to cancer. And this may be because of poor immunity uh, that uh, these mutations then cannot be taken care of. Because the rebel cells, which are multiplying fast, for them, one of the major mechanisms that eliminates them is our own immunity. Then tobacco, alcohol, and other drugs of abuse, and poor sleep. Now, sleep is something that uh, is emerging as a more and more important factor, which affects immunity, as well as increases the risk for almost every lifestyle disease, including cancer. Now, let's look at uh, two of the major factors which are important in relation to cancer. Smoking, we all know, particularly for lung cancer, and uh, tobacco smoke, it's understandable because tobacco smoke contains over 50 known carcinogens. Carcinogens, you know, are substances which uh, promote cancer. And sleep. Now, here is a study. Uh, cancer incidence risk was observed in participants, which means the risk was higher in participants in the study, with a sleep duration of less than seven hours. And uh, among women, with a short, stable sleep trajectory, which means the duration may be more or less sufficient, but the sleep was not stable. They were waking up again and again. They had a disturbed sleep. So the sleep was not only sh short most of the time, but whatever they slept was also unstable. It's a relatively recent study, 2023. Uh, here is the reference in Cancer, one of the most prestigious journals now in its 129th volume, as you can see. But then these days, you know, most of these things get published a little before it is in print, and that is on the internet as an e-publication. And you can get most of these publications as PDFs. You can download the entire study. That has become the norm now, uh, which is very good, which means knowledge has become very freely and easily available. Now, how about mental stress? Does mental stress also increase the possibility of cancer? We can understand because uh, the relationship between stress and the immune system is now well established. We have a whole science called psychoneuroimmunology. That is how psychological factors can translate into 
immunity, which means mental disturbances, chronic stress, how can how it can translate into poor immunity. Those studies are now well known. On the other hand, mental peace and relaxation and being happy and cheerful can strengthen immunity. And therefore, it's understandable that that would have a relationship also to cancer. And uh, here is a, a sort of a review in uh, this uh, booklet that has been brought out by the uh, Stanford School of Medicine, Stanford Center for Integrative Medicine, in which uh, in this chapter, uh, this author Mark Doolittle says, many researchers have found that chronic stress can wear down our body's defenses, lower our immune response, and make us more vulnerable to all sicknesses, including cancer. Now, once again, to sum up the lifestyle factors over which we have some personal control, uh, stress. On the top now, why I've changed it to the top now is because stress has direct as well as indirect effects. The direct effect is on immunity. Stress by itself, everything else being equal, can impair immunity. There are studies psycho in psychoneuroimmunology which have shown that now. So it's not beyond hearsay. It's not that just we feel so, think so, or when a child is having examination stress, the ch child is more likely to fall ill, that sort of anecdotal evidence. It's beyond that. It is well established through proper scientific studies that stress by itself can impair immunity. So that's the direct effect. Why the in what is the indirect effect? When a person is under stress, the person may not take enough exercise. The person doesn't feel like taking exercise. The person may take a poor diet, Either eat too much or to eat too little. Both can happen in stress. Then, you know, uh, one thing in relation to food, which I uh, made point out here is the charred food. It's not only because it's blackened, it doesn't look good, it tastes a little bitter, but it also has carcinogens. Because, you know, if food has been overheated and it has become charred, then what happens is the proteins and the fats in the food interact with each other. And that is what gives that dark color. And then that dark color, uh, has many car carcinogens, that is cancer-promoting substances. Then tobacco, alcohol, and poor sleep. Now, these are the indirect effects. The person who is under stress may take a poor diet. The person who is under stress may consume tobacco and alcohol to beat stress. And the person who is under stress does not generally sleep well. So these are the indirect effects of stress. So therefore, stress is actually the top culprit here. Now, how about metastasis? Metastasis means spread of the cancer, spread to distant organs. And uh, the steps in the spread are firstly local growth. That is locally the tumor starts growing, it expands, and then some of the cells start detaching because the tenacity with which these cancer cells attach to each other is much less than in case of normal cells. There are uh, proteins at the cell junctions which keep the cells together. Those proteins are deficient and that's how the cells can easily detach. Then, you know, once the cells are detached, they may enter the blood vessels or lymph or both and then they circulate throughout the body through these fluids and then they exit into the new tissue. And once they enter the new tissue, they start proliferating there because that is their characteristic. They behave as per their nature. You know, the nature of, uh, uh, does not change. Their Sobhav, you might say, their inclinations do not change. They proliferate in the new tissue and colonize it. And then, you know, they also stimulate the formation of blood vessels so that the blood vessels are by and large able to keep pace with this colonization. And these cells keep getting their nourishment. And that's how they can grow now in a different set of organs to which they have spread. Here's a pictorial uh, representation from this uh, very prestigious scientific journal, Nature. Uh, this is the primary tumor. And uh, here, you know, first it uh, invades, then, you know, it gets into the blood vessels or the lymphatics, and uh, then, you know, it goes out of these and colonizes places like the lungs and the liver. So that is the uh, type of, that's how it spreads. The most common places to which uh, cancer spread are the lungs, the liver, the brain, and the bones. So these are the most sort of the favorite sites for cancer cells to go and colonize in. And uh, most cancer deaths are due to cancer that has metastasized. So uh, once the cancer has reached the stage of spreading, that is the time when 
it becomes more and more difficult to treat the cancer. Now, what are the symptoms of cancer? To start with, generally nothing. So, it's because of it starting in a silent way that uh, we are generally unable to detect it early. The person is not aware. Then the late symptoms may be misleading. For example, if the person is constipated, one does not immediately think of a colorectal cancer. So the late symptoms may be misleading. And uh, when the symptoms do develop, to start with, they are local symptoms, as understandable, because the organ in which the tumor is growing, that does not function properly. Or these local symptoms may be because of pressure, because the tumor starts uh, pressing on the surrounding tissues. For example, in case of the liver, it will, if it presses, or the gallbladder, if it presses on uh, the surrounding tissues, then it will lead to jaundice. So that is due to a mechanical pressure, uh, not letting the things flow. Or there may be a swelling. Of course, one would expect that if something is growing, there will be a swelling, but all swellings inside may not be visible outside. But then, if it is a relatively superficial thing, then uh, one may be able to feel the swelling or when it has grown quite a bit, then one may be able to feel a swelling in the abdomen or something. And to start with, the swelling is painless. And to distinguish it from other types of swellings, which may be inflammatory or something, uh, which are painful uh, but and smooth, the cancer swellings are to start with painless and they are not soft, they are hard and generally not smooth, they have a rough surface. So that's how doctors are able to make out while examining the patient that there is a greater likelihood of this swelling being due to cancer. While the swelling is painless, once the cancer has grown beyond a point, especially when it has spread, especially when it has spread to the bones, it can be extremely painful. In fact, cancer pain is one of the most severe pains known. And that's why in end-stage cancer, very often the main treatment that is required is relieving this pain through the strongest painkillers available, morphine and its related substances. There are some general symptoms of cancer which may occur irrespective of the organ affected. And that can also warn us about cancer, especially in the elderly in whom cancers are more frequent. Unintended weight loss. The person has not made any efforts, does not eat uh, less, uh, and still the person is rapidly losing weight. So rapid unintended weight loss can be a warning. Then the person doesn't feel like eating, loss of appetite. Then anemia, uh, low hemoglobin levels. And failure to respond to nutritional supplements. The person is not eating enough, is losing weight. You give good food, you give nutritional supplements. The person does not respond to them. Even if you force the person to eat them, the body... The weight loss continues, loss of appetite continues, anemia continues. They don't respond to these supplements. Unlike anemia, which most of the time responds to iron and sometimes needs B12 or folic acid, these are the commonest nutritional deficiency anemias, these supplements will not help in relieving the anemia due to cancer. Then, you know, psychological symptoms. After the diagnosis has been made, the person is very disturbed because most people know that cancer is by and large incurable and therefore this has deep psychological, a deep psychological impact. And uh, this may be summed up in terms of these five stages through which the person goes, uh, which have been summed up beautifully by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in her book on death and dying. This is a classic on the subject and applies not only to cancer, but to any serious problem in which the person feels helpless. But particularly to cancer, it's very relevant. And that is, first the person denies, I don't have cancer. I'm sure the diagnosis is wrong. I can't have cancer. Denial. Then, you know, the person is angry when the diagnosis is confirmed and uh, he told repeatedly that it is cancer. The person gets angry. Why me? Why did it have to happen to me? Then the next stage is bargaining. Start praying, bargain with God. If you get me, bring me out of this cancer, then I'll do this for you, I'll do that for you, I'll uh, do this good deed, that good deed, you know, bargaining. When that doesn't seem to help, the cancer continues to progress, the person goes into a depression. And then finally, the person may come to accept 
what has happened, acceptance. So these are the typical sort of psychological symptoms of cancer. I'm sorry I'm rushing through all this because uh, trying to cover a broad canvas and you can always go into the details of all this. Some of the references are given, some you can easily find on Google, but uh, uh, we are trying to cover a lot of ground uh, in a relatively short time. Now, where does the diagnosis come from? History, clinical examination, which doctors are depending less and less on, more they are depending upon investigations. But then uh, the final diagnosis actually comes from the pathologist, the doctor whom the patients never see. So he's sitting in his lab. Now, what does the pathologist do? He looks at a piece of the tissue under the microscope and looking at the characteristics of the cell, the, uh, the pathologist can tell whether there is cancer or no cancer. That is the final diagnosis. And that is what you find uh, also sort of in the form of a novel, a very interesting novel, captivating novel, the final diagnosis by Arthur Haley. Arthur Haley was not a doctor, but he has written on a wide variety of subjects and whatever subject he wrote on, he researched that well. So it's as good as, this book is as good as, as if it had been written by a doctor. And uh, what it brings out is that the final diagnosis rests with the pathologist. There's an interesting exercise that the medical schools have and in the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, where I worked for, uh, which, with which was associated for more than 40 years, starting as a medical student and leaving as a professor. So in that institution, we had an exercise every Tuesday, not every Tuesday, on the first Tuesday of every month, which was called the Clinical Pathological Conference. It was very well attended. And why it was well attended was because of the suspense it held. What was done was initially the clinician who had treated the patient would come and uh, talk about, or some any other clinician who's given the history would come and discuss the case. And uh, based on uh, the history and the investigations, other than the uh, investigations which required a pathologist. All other investigations, everything else was provided. So on the basis of that, this doctor would discuss what is called the differential diagnosis. That is, what are the possibilities? And then he will be told, now you choose one out of these, which you think is most likely. So he'll choose one. In, after going through the entire differential diagnosis, he'll choose one. And then the pathologist was called to tell what the final diagnosis was, what was found in the tissue that the pathologist received. And that was the suspense. So often, very competent doctors, after going through all that discussion for an hour, would reach a wrong diagnosis and the pathologist would come up with a surprise. Not always. Very often the diagnosis was confirmed in what the clinician identified. But the final diagnosis always comes from the pathologist. And that's why, you know, when a surgeon is operating on a cancer, very often what he does to decide how much of radical surgery is required where it's a malignant tumor, then I mean, it's, a, it's actually a cancer, then how much of the tumor to remove tumor plus the surrounding tissues, if it has, whether it has to spread the, to the lymph nodes, so that some lymph nodes would also be removed. So the tumor and the lymph nodes would be all sent from the operation theater itself to the pathologist. That's what they call a frozen section. That is quickly taken, frozen, and then for which you can get a quick report, which is not necessarily the final report, but sufficiently reliable for the surgeon to be able to decide. So on the frozen section, the pathologist will quickly send back the diagnosis. And while the patient is still on the operation table, the surgeon can then decide what to do, whether to remove only the tumor, whether to remove also the regional lymph nodes, how radical the surgery should be. So the final diagnosis actually comes from the pathologist by looking at the cells. Now, this may be an opportune moment also to talk about a few, few myths which are very common about cancer. The myth that cancer is contagious. Cancer does not spread from one person to the other and therefore we don't have to try and maintain a distance from a cancer patient that we may catch the cancer. We don't catch cancer. Secondly, that cancer is inherited. Tendency to get cancer in some cancers may be inherited, but by and large, that is only a minor factor. Other factors are far more important. Then, non-smokers do not get lung cancer. This is again a myth. Although, the smokers are more likely to get lung cancer, many non-smokers also do get lung cancer. And in fact, that applies to all lifestyle factors. A person may have a perfectly healthy lifestyle, everything may be right, 
still there's no guarantee that the person will not get a cancer. All, every, everything being right, still the person can get cancer. Then that all cancers are equally bad. They're all incurable. They all kill. They all kill quickly. You know, that is a general tendency. But all cancers are not equally bad. Different types of cancers have a different type of progression or prognosis, as it is technically called. That is the outcome is different in different cancers. Then all cancers have similar treatment. Although there are some broad modes of treatment, modalities of treatment, which we'll talk about, all cancers do not have the same type of treatment. The treatments can also be radically different. Then, you know, the moment the person is told that it's a tumor, the person equates it with a cancer. That's not true. Uh, tumors can be benign. And benign tumors are curable. They may need surgery. Sometimes they don't even need surgery, like a lipoma. Unless it is too big and disfiguring, a lipoma can stay in the body without doing any harm. Lipoma you know, is just a collection of fat cells, a big fat collection of fat cells, which is quite soft, uh, not hard like a cancer swelling. And uh, so there are tumors which are benign and tumors which are malignant. Benign tumors are not cancer and they do not kill. It's only malignant tumors which kill. So and that's a malignant tumor is a cancer. Then that cancer is due to longer life expectancy. That uh, it's because people are living longer now, now that infectious diseases and nutritional deficiencies have been conquered, instead of dying in 30s and 40s, as people used to once upon a time, uh, now they are dying in their 70s and 80s. And because they live longer, something has to happen. And one of the things that can happen is cancer. And that's why the prevalence of cancer or the, rather the incidence of cancer is increasing. But uh, uh, the longer life expectancy might make some contribution, but there are statistical tools by which it has been determined that uh, even if we correction for, correct for the longer life expectancy, there is a genuine increase in the incidence of cancer, which is primarily because of a poor lifestyle and environmental factors like pollution, etc. Then there's a myth that uh, vegetarians do not get cancer. Uh, that's again not true. Uh, any lifestyle factor we can take care of and still the person may get cancer. There's no guarantee. Or that good people do not get cancer. Cancer is a punishment for evil. That's not really true. In fact, to some extent, the opposite is true. Because uh, there have been some studies, controversial though, on cancer personality. What is the type of personality a cancer patient has? And what they have found is that actually these are very nice people. And uh, they are so nice that uh, they want to please others. And therefore, they don't talk about their problems. They suppress their emotions. And uh, these are the people in whom ultimately this suppressed uh, mental distress can manifest as cancer. Which means that uh, good people can get cancer. Uh, what is important is that uh, a person should not just try to be good if the person uses his inner strength and uh, his psychological sort of uh, uh, tools, as well as what are called ego defense tools, as well as the spiritual approach to life, so that he can tap into his inner resources, his inner strength uh, properly, then this is the type of person who can be nice and yet not get cancer. Just trying to be nice to please others and while suppressing all the resentment that you have within, actually increases perhaps the possibility of getting cancer. Now, we talked about the inner strength by which uh, a person may be able to uh, be good and at the same time not get cancer. So let's uh, now, since it's going to be a little longer session, uh, let's uh, turn to some a little short musical break on the inner strength to a well-known uh, song, Itni Shakti Hame Dena. इतनी शक्ति हमें दे न दाता मन का विश्वास कमजोर होना इतनी शक्ति हमें दे न दाता 
मन का विश्वास कमजोर होना हम चले ने रस्ते पे हमसे भूल कर भी कोई भूल हो ना इतनी शक्ति हमें दे न दाता मन का विश्वास कमजोर हो ना दूर अज्ञान के हो अंधेरे तू हमें ज्ञान की रोशनी दे हर बुराई से बच के रहे हम जितनी भी दे भली जिंदगी दे बैर होना किसी का किसी से भावना हो न बदले की हो ना हम चले नेक रस्ते पे हमसे भूल कर भी कोई भूल हो ना इतनी शक्ति हमें दे न दाता मन का विश्वास कमजोर हो ना हर तरफ जुल्म है बेबसी है सहमा सहमा सा हर आदमी है पाप का बोझ बढ़ता ही जाए जान कैसे ये धरती बसी है बोझ ममता का तू में उठा ले तेरी रचना का एक अंत हो ना हम चले ने रस्ते पे हमसे भूल कर भी कोई भूल हो ना इतनी शक्ति हमें दे न दाता मन का विश्वास कमजोर हो ना Thank you very much for playing that uh, beautiful music. Uh, it was uh, for those of you who may not have understood the language, of course you would have enjoyed the melody. But uh, the yes, this song was essentially about uh, praying for inner strength, praying uh, God for the inner strength, so that we will not uh, do anything wrong, even unintentionally. And uh, then you know a few things were brought out. about uh, how we will live a life full of love and how we'll avoid negativities like revenge which is one of the most negative emotions so strengthening and feeding the positive and uh, avoiding the negative in life is essentially the way to, to tap that inner strength that inner resource which all of us have and uh, when we are praying to god for that inner strength that god in a way also within us so that strength can come from within from our own soul which is our divine essence we just have to let it manifest so with that now we can again turn to the powerpoint Yes. So this is where we left uh, the myths about cancer. Let's turn to the next one: treatment options. Now, where what are the various treatment options available in cancer? But before we go to the treatment, let's look at the prevention. The prevention is always better, and easier, and cheaper than cure. And naturally, prevention will depend upon the causes about which we can do something. And the most important remains stress 
which has, as we have seen, direct as well as indirect effects. So, uh, taking care of stress, so the direct and indirect effects are less, and also paying some direct attention to these factors like physical activity, diet, drugs of abuse, and sleep. And uh, here is a, a quote from Anup Kumar. He's not a doctor, but he went through the experience of cancer and has written this beautiful book, The Joy of Cancer, in which uh, he says that the human soul at peace is strong ammunition against malignant cells. So it means that when these malignant cells develop, right at their inception, when they are just beginning to develop, if at that time one is at peace, the immunity becomes strong and that immunity may be looked upon as ammunition against the malignant cells, although there could be gentler ways of looking at the malignant cells, but all the same, uh, this is one way in which very often it's looked at, that we need a, a weapons, we need a, a battle to be, there's a battle to be fought with the malignant cells, so he uses this word ammunition. But then peace translates into good immunity and good immunity translates into those weapons which work against malignant cells. Now, when we say when you're talking about uh, uh, prevention, how about screening? How about this? this sorry. How about screening? Uh, which means that uh, we conduct tests on either everybody or those who are at higher risk to detect if there's an early cancer already there. Uh, no, this is something which seems very logical, but uh, it doesn't always help too much because screening will uh, detect a tumor only after it has developed. It will not help us uh, detect it before that. And secondly, particularly in the case of prostate cancer, what has been found is that uh, it can lead to unnecessary treatment because uh, when you, if a person above 80, a man, I mean, above 80 dies of... Uh, and dies due to some cause other than prostate cancer, if that person, uh, if an autopsy is done on this person, that is, uh, at least some parts of the body are examined under the microscope, one very often finds a focus of cancer in the prostate. The person has died of something else. The person is around 80 years of age, died of something else, and the person had cancer in the prostate, but remained blissfully unaware of it and died of something else which means that the, the body's mechanisms were enough to keep it under some sort of a check and therefore he did not really die of prostate cancer. On the other hand, suppose screening was done and uh, one found that uh, the prostate-specific antigens, the PSA levels are high. Then the doctor would have suspected prostate cancer. Then if you do a test, that is you do a biopsy, by chance if the needle hits the point where the cancer fo focus of cancer is, and you confirm it under the microscope, you examine those cells, yes, there is a cancer, it was suspected and it's actually there. Then the person will start, will have to be put on cancer treatment and partly because of the treatment, partly because of the fear of death, partly because of the seriousness of the diagnosis, all these things put together would mean that the person may die of cancer. And he dies of cancer because it was detected and it was detected because of the screening. So that is also one point of view because of which screening in all cases is not always justified. And there are national guidelines which differ from one country to another about which are the situations and which are the populations in which what type of screening should be done, which is relatively more valuable. Now we come to treatment proper, surgery. This remains the top choice. So it means that if the tumor is at a stage where it is operable and it has not spread, that can actually lead to cure. And the explanation is very simple. Because uh, if the surgeon has removed the tumor and the tumor had not yet spread, the surgeon you know, has done very good surgery, but no surgeon can ensure that he'll remove every possible cancer cell from the body. In fact, while doing the surgery, while manipulating the uh, tumor, this malignant tumor, he might release some of the cells from the tumor into the bloodstream and that might, in fact, facilitate the spread. So, 
all that is happening. The surgeon has removed the tumor. He has also not removed every possible single cell. He has also in a way facilitated the spread by squeezing some cells out of the tumor into the blood vessels. But now, on the whole, what has the surgeon achieved? Surgeon has achieved a drastic reduction in the number of tumor cells in the body. So much of the tumor has been removed. The bulk has been removed. So this is what technically we say, the surgeon has brought down the tumor load. He has brought down the tumor load. Now the remaining cancer cells, whether they are at the local site or whether they have spread to the blood because of the squeezing of the tumor, now these remaining cancer cells are relatively few and they can be taken care of by the immune system of the body. You know, uh, the immune cells will recognize them as foreign cells, cells which have come from outside and therefore the immune system can take care of these remaining cells. Therefore, what is needed is a strong immune system once again. So even if the immune system was temporarily incompetent, which let the tumor grow, one can strengthen it. And uh, it's not something that uh, once a weak immunity, always a weak immunity. One can always uh, strengthen it. And uh, therefore, what is important is to have a strong immune system. And that is how surgery might actually cure cancer. And this is very relevant in uh, terms of what we'll talk in quite some length in this session about uh, how the just as stress was the major factor which directly and indirectly affected the uh, increased the risk for cancer in the same way once again it is psychological factors which become most important when it comes to the cure from cancer after surgery and naturally since the psychology of everybody is different each individual will respond differently even if the cancer is the same and this is something which is not new. Uh, all ancient systems of medicine knew it. Here is uh, the father of modern medicine, Hippocrates. Uh, it is more important to know what sort of person has a disease than to know what sort of disease a person has. So the what course the disease follows depends not only on the disease, but also on the person who has the disease, what type of person the person, what type of person he is who has the disease. And in Ayurveda, of course, the entire uh, approach is individualistic and the individual's prakriti is determined. And that's how uh, one can, one looks at why this person was vulnerable, why this person was more at risk of this particular disease and what is the type of treatment that will suit the best this person. So the individual variation is taken care of in Ayurveda. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, in modern medicine, uh, it's not to that same extent and uh, it's a one-size-fits-all approach, but all the same, uh, the very roots of modern medicine also, this individuality has been recognized and uh, the father of modern medicine and also recent physicians like Sir William Osler and so on, they have talked about the same thing and the cancer surgeons like Bernie Siegel, whom we'll come to, they all observed that uh, it's uh, not just the disease uh, that the person has, but what sort of a person has the disease that matters a lot. Now, what do patients who live much longer than expected have in common? Which means, what is the type of person who lives much longer even after getting cancer? Firstly, this person has a strong will to live. It's a psychological factor. Secondly, he defies cancer, he defies the verdict of the doctors. Even if the doctor tells him that uh, uh, an average patient of this type lives only for one year, he says, well, uh, the doctor is not God, I'll prove the doctor wrong. This is this type of patient who lives longer, whereas the one who thinks that, well, if the doctor has said so, then it will happen, then is the one who dies on schedule. So doctor says one year, he dies after one year. But the person who says, I'll prove the doctor wrong, that's the person who lives longer. So defiance, yes. But denial, no. He doesn't deny that I don't have cancer. I can't get cancer. So he doesn't spend too much time on in the denial mode. You know, we saw that for the first psychological response very often is denial. So he doesn't stay there for very long. After the diagnosis is confirmed, he doesn't go into anger and bargaining. Instead, he takes a constructive approach and says, I will defy what applies to most people. I'll do, I'll do something. I'll achieve something different. So defiance, yes, denial, no. Then, you know, he demands a full life, no matter how long. 
He doesn't treat cancer as the end of the world. He says, well, I have got advance notice. I may not have very long to live, but whatever time I still have to live, I will live my life fully. In fact, I'll try to do all those things which I had been postponing so far. Now I'll try to do them. Then, you know, they take charge of the care, which means they don't leave everything to the doctor and the doctors and nurses. They take charge of the care because they feel that I know my body better than anybody else and I'm more responsible than anybody else for what happens to me. Then, you know, they are generally inwardly defined. Now, here that characteristic of being nice people may come in, in fact, handy because uh, they are not uh, looking at things from outside on the surface, how others are behaving. They are more sort of introspective by nature and uh, they are... Uh, sort of able to determine what their criteria or what their priorities are much better than uh, they depend upon that rather than upon how everybody else is looking at their disease. Even more important what uh, applies to these people is that they're not even obsessed with the disease. They uh, just take it as an advance notice and just want to live a full life. Not only that, they're not even obsessed with themselves, which means that they feel that, well, now the time to become a better person. Life is not very long. I'm not going to live very long. And therefore, let me be more helpful to people. They may become more loving, caring, and sharing. Not only that, if they have uh, hurt somebody in the past, they approach that person and tell him that I'm sorry. On the other hand, if somebody has hurt them in the past, they approach that person also and tell that person, I have genuinely forgiven you. And uh, with this approach, they find that uh, the people around them start behaving better because this person is now apologizing to some and forgiving others. And they also know that this person has cancer, may not live very long. So they are even nicer than they would be otherwise. So they build up an atmosphere of love and goodwill around them. And in the process, they grow spiritually because that is the route to spiritual growth. And they also facilitate the spiritual growth of others, not only the immediate family, but also of others, other relatives, friends, contacts with whom they did not have a contact for quite some time, and the caregivers. They can even facilitate the spiritual growth of caregivers, this type of patients. So they're full of love. They become even, they were, that is their nature. They were always full of love. Now they become even more loving. And these are the patients who end up, after undergoing surgery, the tumor was operable and they've undergone surgery and it had not spread. These are the people who get completely cured. And uh, Bernie Siegel, a cancer surgeon, calls them exceptional cancer patients or ECAPs. So this is what ECAPs have in common. So Bernie Siegel says that ECAPs may not be very frequent. But instead of dismissing them as an occasional sort of occurrence, which somehow is a miracle and we don't know why it happens and how it happens. Now we know why it happens, why these people are exceptional. But can they teach us something? They teach us firstly, uh, who is able to get that cure. It's not a miracle. It's not just a sort of a uh, small statistical probability. It is uh, something which has a basis in the type of person who has the disease. Secondly, what they can teach us is, that if this is the approach to the disease, which comes naturally to some people and helps them get cured, can we inculcate the same attitude in others to whom it does not come naturally? Now, attitudes are not easy to change. But this is a situation when the person has, a, has an incurable disease like cancer, a basically incurable disease like cancer, this is the time when the person's attitudes are a little easier to change. So why not provide that type of psycho-spiritual counseling which will change the attitude of the person and he'll also become yet one more exceptional cancer patient. Can it be done? Bernie Siegel and many others have tried to do it and they find it can be done. And that's how you can make these people live much longer than expected and sometimes overcome the cancer completely. Eventually, everybody has to die. But the fact is that the remainder becomes longer and the remainder becomes more meaningful. Now, here is uh, another medical doctor, Atul Gawande. Uh, he has written this beautiful book, Being Mortal, which is essentially about old age, but as understandable in this book, quite a bit about cancer. 
And he says, what have patients who live much longer than expected taught us? No, again, the same approach that what can the exceptional cancer patients teach us? He also says that what is it that they have taught us? The lesson seems almost Zen. You live longer only when you stop trying to live longer. So these people are not trying to live longer. They don't mind if they say, well, I've got advanced notice. It's better than dying suddenly. So let me make the best use of life. And the best use is become a better person, love more. So they're not trying to live longer. They're trying to love more. So love rather than wish to live. Of course, they have a will to live. Because will to live and the wish to die, both can be potent forces. That's again the mind-body connection. These people want to live, but they're not obsessed with living longer. They are obsessed with living more meaningfully and they find that meaning in life by loving even more than they did earlier. Now, that much about surgery. And why I spend that much time on surgery, you can understand, because that is the only treatment if it is done relatively early in the course of the disease, which can increase, which has a very high chance of a complete cure. Now, how about chemotherapy and radiotherapy, the two other major modes which are used in combination with surgery? Now, these two are a double-edged weapon because uh, they work primarily on the rapidly dividing cells. The cancer cells are also rapidly dividing and they also they will affect these. But then there are other cells in the body which also divide rapidly, like say the skin cells, intestinal cells, the hair which grow on the skin. And... Uh, it's because they also affect the other rapidly dividing cells, the blood cells, that the person gets side effects. So killing the cancer cells increases the possibility of uh, the disease uh, getting better, the person living longer. Killing the cancer cells helps that much. But then uh, by acting on the other rapidly dividing cells come the side effects. Some of them may be only cosmetic, like uh, having hair loss. But some of them are more serious, like say, the effect on blood cells would weaken the immunity. So on one hand, we are trying to help the patient by uh, killing the rapidly dividing cancer cells. On the other hand, by reducing the population of rapidly dividing blood cells, we are weakening the immunity, which itself can, which otherwise could have helped in fighting the cancer. So the inbuilt mechanism for correcting the cancer is being weakened. So you are weakening the intrinsic capacity of the body and strengthening the, and on the other hand, killing some cancer cells using these weapons which act on rapidly dividing cells. And therefore, uh, one has to see sort of what the balance is. On the whole, is the benefit more than the harm that we are doing? And if that seems to be so, then these are justified and uh, that has been the general approach. But uh, that explains the side effects. But then these side effects, some of these side effects and the disease as a whole, uh, can be also looked at not only very seriously as an opportunity for spiritual growth and so on, it can also be, one can bring in a dose of humor into it. And uh, that always helps in strengthening the immunity. You know, we have that classical case of Norman Cousins, who got himself cured of the autoimmune disease, ankylosing spondylitis, uh, spondylitis, literally through a combination of laughter and vitamin C. Laughter was a major component of his self-treatment. And... Uh, that's how he came out of that disease from which only one in a 500 come out. So laughter itself can be also a good boost for the immunity. So here is a, a cartoon from again, in this book by Anup Kumar, The Joy of Cancer. And now this person has got this side effect, lost hair because of uh, cancer treatment. And then he's shown a variety of wigs which he can use. And uh, so this Doctor is telling him, look at it this way. Now you can change your hairstyle every day of the week. Now, are there some new tools other than surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation therapy? Some of the new kids on the block are targeted therapy. Now, targeted therapy, uh, unlike chemotherapy, is not a general sort of a tool for rapidly dividing cells. Targeted therapy tries to bank on the basic differences between a cancer cell and a normal cell in the body and uses those diff characteristics which are unique to cancer cells to target cancer cells. That's why it's targeted therapy. 
Immunotherapy, on the other hand, tries to strengthen the immune mechanisms of the body and sometimes by itself provides that immunity by injecting into the person antibodies to the tumor cells. You know, antibodies can neutralize uh, whatever these antibodies are against. So the antibodies against the tumor cells will help in eliminating the tumor cells. So again, it is a more specific type of therapy for tumor cells. You identify the antigenic characteristics of the immune cells, sorry, of the cancer cells and manufacture antibodies which will work against those cancer cells and provide that. So targeted therapy and immune therapy are relatively more selective and focused, uh, working primarily on the tumor cells and not on all rapidly dividing cells as conventional chemotherapy and radiation therapy did. Then laser has also been used as a tool to destroy cancer cells. Uh, so these are some of the newer modes of treatment. But then uh, the fact remains that especially when the cancer has spread and we saw most of the deaths in cancer are because of metastasis that is spread. When that has happened, sooner or later, the person gets worse and it's quite obvious that the person will not recover. And that is the time when the pain may also be severe. So managing that pain, other symptoms, making the person's life comfortable becomes a major focus of treatment. And under that come these two things, palliative care and hospice care. They are similar, there are overlaps, but there's a the basic difference between the two. Palliative care means that you, your focus is on pain and symptom management, but that doesn't stop the rest of the treatment. The rest of the treatment continues along with that. Whereas when a person goes to the hospice, then uh, the person knows and everybody there knows that this person doesn't have very long to live and we just have to basically make the person comfortable. The rest of the treatment is stopped. Now you may feel that uh, the person who goes to the hospice will therefore live less because the rest of the treatment has been stopped, whereas in palliative care, the rest of the treatment continues. But the interesting thing is that many studies, in fact, point in the other direction. People in the hospice sometimes end up living longer than those who are in palliative care. Why that happens, we'll see briefly as we go along. Then which are the other approaches? Ayurveda and other systems of medicine, they have their approaches to cancer, which can, which are not an either-or approach. They can be combined with modern medicine. And uh, we have uh, a session on Ayurveda uh, already uploaded on the YouTube channel of Yes Spirituality. So I'll not go into that. Then there are various mind-body approaches, which depend upon the mind-body connection positive thinking and so on and so forth. And one of those we'll see in a moment, imagery. Then yoga, not just as a set of physical practices, but as a way of life. Again, you know, we have plenty of material on Yes Spirituality YouTube channel. So we'll not get into how yoga can be a total way of life, how it can help in stress management and so on. And uh, spiritual care. That is bringing primarily the spiritual approach to life and spiritual approach to the disease, which is a part of life. Now here is imagery. Now the person sits down, meditates for some time, and then after 10 or 15 minutes of meditation, he starts visualizing what is going on inside the body in a positive manner. And many types of imagery have been used in cases of cancer. In some cases, what the person visualizes is that uh, I have bullets in my body, the drugs that I'm taking are working like those bullets, and they are shooting the cancer cells down. Now, this is looking at cancer as a sort of an enemy to be fought. But then there are gentler imageries, which uh, many people love more. And that is, imagine a beautiful bird entering your body. And it is pecking on the cancer cells one by one, using them as food for itself, or taking them away, flying and feeding its babies. You know, here you can see a bird feeding its babies. The babies are hungry. And what this bird has brought from this patient is not veins or worms, but has brought these cancer cells. So that's how the cancer cells are disappearing and they are being used as food for the bird and the bird's babies. Now, this is also an imagery, but this is a very gentle type of imagery. Now, once the person has been diagnosed with cancer, this part is a little more for doctors than for the general public, but all the same, one should know it. How do we break the news? I've purposely not called it breaking bad news, which is how generally it's called. 
how to break the news that the person has cancer. First question arises, should we do it? Because there are some people who feel that it can be kept a secret from the patient, if not the relatives. And the relatives very often request that please do not uh, uh, please do not tell the patient. The patient will be very disturbed. Now, the, here, the verdict is pretty clear. Almost everybody agrees. The question is not whether we should do it. We should always do it. The news should be broken. The only question is how we should do it. So the question is not whether the news should be broken to the patient and the relatives. They should be broken to both the patient and the relatives. The only question is how to do it. And even if we don't do it, the patient invariably knows. Even without our doing it, but that may cost the trust of the doctor. He doesn't trust the doctor as much if the doctor tried to hide this news from him and he discovers it through other sources. So the news has to be broken and uh, it has to be done by the doctor. The only question is how to do it. Before we go how to do it, uh, let's say have a look at this cartoon. gives a little break from serious discussion. Here there's a, a patient on the operation table and uh, the surgeon and other doctors, the assistants to this doctor and nurses and all they are there, but they're all wearing masks. Now this a patient cries out, but how can I tell you are my doctor? Which means that there is a certain personal relationship with the doctor which is vital in the treatment of any disease, particularly in a serious disease like cancer. So the basic thing in breaking good news, sorry, breaking bad news or breaking the news of cancer is that uh, the uh, patient has to have a personal rapport with the doctor and for that the doctor has to give time. Now let's see how not to break. And this is uh, I particularly taken this quote, oh, sorry, and this from uh, uh, this book by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, which I referred to earlier on death and dying. This is an anecdote, which means that it, some doctor has actually done it, spending very little time. And the in this case, the doctor is breaking the news to a relative, to the patient's mother. It's a lady who has got the disease and the, uh, he has called the uh, mother of this patient aside while the patient is watching, that he the doctor is telling my mother to come in in another room. So the patient knows that something serious. That's why he's not telling in front of me. He's taken her to another room and spending as little time as possible. He's telling her, I have some bad news for you. She has such and such disease and she's not going to get well. That's all. Nothing can be done. We don't know the cause. We don't know the cure. There's a lot of people who have it. It's incurable. And that's all there is to it. She'll just have to accept it. Almost as briefly as this, in spite of the lady trying to ask him a few questions. So the questions are replied in this type of language. This is not to do it. This is not the way to break this news of a diagnosis like cancer. Then how to do it? Firstly, have enough time to talk. Be prepared unless you have at least half an hour to spend with the patient and the patient's relatives. Don't break the news. When you have that half an hour, then only do it. Second is, don't take away hope. Leave the door open for hope. And what is the type of hope one can give? That uh, there are many new treatments that are uh, coming and uh, there's a lot of research going on. And while your treatment is going on, still further new treatments which might come, which could be better than the existing treatments. And a lot of people have got a lot of uh, benefit from having faith in the divine, faith in the, the capacity of their own body to heal, faith in the mind-body approach, whatever you like to say. And by praying, miracles have happened. And if miracles happen to others, you could be one of those to whom those miracles could happen. And then we are all in it together. You, your family and I, that is the doctor. We have to work on the cancer together as a team. Now, this is a, another way to do it and spend half an hour talking, answering all the questions that the patient and the relatives might have. This is one of the approaches. Another question which arises is, the news has been broken. The patient is likely to ask, what is the prognosis? That is, how long will I live? Now, again, one way in which should not be done is uh, by saying that an average patient of your type lives for one year or two years. That is not to do it. Please do not let statistics kill anecdotes which is there are some anecdotes of some uh, 
patients having overcome the disease completely do not let statistics that is an average patient lives this much do not let that statistics kill those anecdotes because uh, those anecdotes of miracle the miraculous recovery are also true they may be occasional they may be only anecdotes but all the same how do you know that this person in front of you will not end up being one of those anecdotes in which there was a miraculous cure how do you know that this patient will just comply with the average and uh, that gives you a hint that the news should be broken the diagnosis should also be given but not in the form of a prediction that you are likely to live this much does it mean we should not tell the truth yes we should tell the truth when you broke the news again we saw that the basically truth was spoken when you give the prognosis again you can you are speaking the truth when you say that uh, well nobody can say how long you will live and there have been many cures many people have recovered completely you could be one of them now again you are telling the truth but you are telling that part of the truth which is encouraging which gives hope to the patient it's better to give hope even if it is false hope but rather than giving false no hope which means average patients live one lives one year and therefore you should not expect to live any longer so you are taking away hope and this is also false because how do you know that this patient will not be one of those exceptional patients e caps so just as this hope can be false no hope can also be false this is not any nearer the truth than this it better to give hope even if you think it is false hope this false hope works as a placebo it works through the mind body connection you know placebo is a drug which doesn't have any pharmacological effect but still it works through the mind body connection so this hope also works like that placebo in contrast this no hope taking away hope works like a nocebo just the opposite it can hasten death again bernie segal the same cancer surgeon from his experience he said there are four crucial faiths which are important in the recovery of the patient the person becoming exceptional patient faith in oneself that is i have the capacity to heal my body my body has self healing potent self healing mechanisms the immune system which will help me and bring me out faith in the doctor for that the rapport with the doctor is important faith in the treatment this doctor is giving me good treatment it will work and spiritual faith god will help me and god will ensure that whatever is best for me will happen so that gives a type of acceptance which uh, is uh, important again we can have a short break uh, ye mat kaho khuda se so that is spiritual faith
Beautiful. And this is one of my favorite uh, devotional songs. Don't tell God that uh, I have major problems. Instead, tell your problems that my God is much more powerful than you. And uh, after all, uh, what are problems as compared to the one who knows everything and can do everything? That is what God is about. All-knowing and all-powerful. And uh, Therefore, no problem is too big for that force, that higher force. Anything that appears very difficult to us can be very easy for him. So that's what this is about. I'll again turn to these slides. So spiritual faith. My God is greater than any problem. Now, the economics of cancer. Again, an important topic, although not a medical topic, but then partly medical also because health economics is a field in itself in community medicine. Uh, now, here is a patient who is startled by the bill. And he says, again, from the same book, the cartoon, The Joy of Cancer by Anup Kumar, who himself uh, went through cancer and recovered from it. He has written this beautiful book. He's not a doctor. Now I know why they wear masks in hospitals. Because the master normally associated with the, uh, those who don't want to reveal their face, like thieves and robbers. So looking at the bill, if you, now I know they don't want to be seen. They don't, know, don't want to show who is it that uh, he's, who is sending this bill. Now, the economics of cancer has at least three aspects. One is the patient and her family. The family is very often driven to bankruptcy by through cancer treatment. Cancer treatment can be extremely expensive. Then, you know, the government or the society, which in a way are the same because it's the taxpayer in the society who funds the government, who may provide uh, some relief through free hospitals or partly free hospitals. But then there's no country in the world where any government can uh, subsidize or take care of all the cancer treatment that is available today. Then, you know, enter the insurance companies. If one has insurance, then uh, the insurance company has more or less guaranteed, depending upon the type of scheme one has opted for, that uh, even cancer will be taken care of. But insurance companies are also finding it more and more difficult to cope with the larger number of patients living longer, people living longer and getting cancer where the treatment can be very expensive. The insurance companies are also finding it difficult to cope. And therefore, in a way, some sort of a ray of hope for alternative approaches, which can be very useful, has come from insurance companies. They have funded the type of research in which they have uh, tried to see whether all the intensive, aggressive treatment, which is sometimes used to keep the patient just a little longer, is worthwhile. It may not be worthwhile, not only because it only prolongs misery for a, a brief period, it is not worthwhile because uh, even uh, the a patient does not want it most of the time. When the patient has accepted the disease and knows that now nothing much can be done, the person would much rather have a better quality of life rather than go through a longer misery. So the patient doesn't want it. Another important finding of some of these studies sponsored by the insurance companies are that patients who go to the hospice 
where they don't have uh, uh, the tubes going into all their orifices through the mouth and through the ureter and many artificial orifices which have been created to create fistulas and uh, 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 intravenous nutrition lines and so on. So if that has not been done, the patient has a much better quality of life. The patient is surrounded by sympathetic uh, nurses most of the time who are very affectionate uh, and has... Uh, this, this person actually, in spite of not getting the treatment, ends up living longer than the person who's going through that aggressive treatment. So not only the person has a better quality of life, the remainder of the li life, in fact, sometimes gets longer. I mean, several studies have shown that. These are the studies which have been quoted by Atul Gawande in that book, you know, Being Mortal. Uh, he has quoted many such studies. So the insurance companies have actually opened up a new vista about how far to go with aggressive treatment. But then there's no clear answer about how much to do. Then the other economics part is that the patient and the family are go bankrupt. But at the same time, social grace, you know, comes in here. And the family keeps reassuring the patient that uh, don't worry about the expenses. We'll somehow find the money and take give you the best possible treatment. Uh, even if they know that the, basically it's not worth it. But that's what they say out of decency because they feel that's their duty to do so. And the patient very often does not want that aggressive treatment, but succumbs to what uh, the uh, what the family is telling him and says that, okay, if you want, then I can go through some more treatment. So the patient is not very much interested in the treatment, yet the patient also becomes a party to this decision. And then on top of that, if the doctors also tell him that, yes, at least give it a try, then, you know, and the family says, yes, don't worry about the expenses, give it a try. So both the family and the uh, doctor who are patients' well-wishers, and the patient knows they are my well-wishers. If they are saying so, the patient says, maybe I'm not wrong. Maybe there is some hope. Maybe let me try the treatment. So that's how it works. Now, the magnitude of this problem comes out from this little quote from Atul Gawande's book, Being Mortal. He's a doctor in the United States, born and brought up there. Uh, Indian origin, but born and brought up in the U.S., so our medical system is excellent at trying to stave off death, postpone death sort of, and that also trying to postpone. With dollar twelve thousand a month chemotherapy, dollar forty thousand a day. Here you know the unit a month. Here this is a three times the amount in a day. Dollar forty thousand a day intensive care, and dollar seven thousand an hour. Here is a day, and she has an every hour seven thousand an hour surgery. So these are the types of treatments that are now available. Just an attempt to postpone death, dollar twelve thousand a month chemotherapy, dollar forty thousand a day intensive care, or seven dollar seven thousand an hour surgery. But ultimately, death comes, and few are good at knowing when to stop. We have created a multi. He goes on at another place. We have created a multi-trillion dollar edifice for dispensing the medical equivalent of lottery tickets. You know, lottery ticket. Uh, you know, you sell millions of tickets and only a few will actually win the lottery. So it's a, a sort of a gamble. Very little no chance of getting winning the lottery, but yet millions are sold in the hope that, yes, I might be the one who wins it. But then there, you know, the stakes are not the same as in case of uh, cancer or expenditure on cancer. We have created a multi-trillion dollar edifice for dispensing the medical equivalent of lottery tickets and have only the rudiments of a system to prepare patients for the near certainty that those tickets will not win. We know that most of those tickets will not be won. The person will die and die pretty early, but we have not spent enough time to prepare the patient for it, which is more important than selling these lottery tickets. Now, how can we prepare the patient for it? Through the psycho-spiritual approach and also by Letting the patient have what the patient wants. Patients, in fact, very often want the right thing. They want to talk about end-of-life issues. They want to talk about making a will. They want to talk about their last wishes. They want to talk about how my last rites should be conducted. They want to uh, talk to people and tell them, well, I, have apolog I apologize for this. I have forgiven this. I love you a lot. And so on. That is the type of things they want to say. We don't prepare the patient for any of those things because all the time is spent centered around medical care. And uh, that means lying on the hospital bed where the uh, 
relatives are allowed only occasionally for a few hours at a time. So the, especially in the in ICU, if the person is the intensive care, uh, no visitors allowed except for a little peep every few hours. So there's no time for what the patient wants to do at the end of life. So we are not preparing the patient. The patient wants more devotional music. The patient wants to talk to a priest or to a spiritual teacher. There's no, all, that's not always available. That All that is seen peripheral, sort of some sort of an adjunct which may have some use, but the focus is on aggressive medical treatment, which is like selling lottery tickets. And uh, most of those tickets will not win. And yet we are not preparing the patient for what is much more likely. Instead of a lottery ticket winning, the patient is actually going to die pretty soon. For that, we are doing not enough to prepare the patient. Now that then merges with the sociology of cancer. The patient and her family, you know, the patient succumbs to the doctor and the family and everybody who tells him that uh, he, the uh, don't worry about money, take the uh, treatment, best will give you the best treatment. So succumbs to that. Then friends and relatives, uh, the, they very often offer help. Some of them, in fact, make themselves scarce. That also happens in times of need. Uh, but uh, many of them do offer genuine help out of love. Now that also one has to accept because uh, some may offer money, some may offer something else. For example, Anu Kumar says that uh, at a certain point when it became difficult for them to afford a car, a friend left her car and the driver at their disposal for three months at a stretch. Use this whenever you want to go anywhere. Now that type of a thing given out of love can be accepted because giving love and receiving love both can be a source of spiritual growth. Giving love, one can understand how it can make us grow spiritually. But receiving love grat gratefully can also be a source of spiritual growth because what is it that comes in way of our accepting something which is being given with genuine love? Our ego. So accepting that love also helps us transcend the ego, go beyond the ego, which is one of the most important things to happen in spiritual growth. So receiving love gratefully is also a part of that. So friends and relatives come in. That is part of the sociology of cancer. Then, you know, uh, one has to decide when, at what point to let go. Because we saw that, uh, you know, uh, we saw this, uh, that one can postpone death a little bit with this type of expenditure and this type of aggressive treatment, which actually is not letting the patient do what the patient wants to do at the end of life. So when to let go and say, well, let's try and do what will prepare the person for uh, the onward journey of the soul when the soul has left this world. So it means when to let go. Let the person continue the journey in another world. So we won't decide. Now that is becoming difficult because of conventional morality. The conventional morality has been we should do the best for our the member of our family, try to provide the best treatment. For the doctors, again, the conventional ethics is they try to prolong life no matter how. But then that applied to times when uh, this type of aggressive treatment did not exist. And that's why morality can change with times. And people have started questioning whether that conventional morality still holds. And we have in our ancient Indian culture the concept of yoga dharma. That is, dharma, that is what is right and wrong, depends upon the yoga. Yoga is the times, the era. So the, as change of times, what is right and wrong, what is moral and immoral can change. And it is time to rethink because of the new realities in the medical world. Now, just as people in the hospice live longer, people also live longer, and that is possible in a hospice, when end-of-life discussions are held, which means that the relatives those who are near and dear ones for the patient, they sit with the patient and they talk about things like uh, what the last wishes are, how the last rites should be conducted. And uh, uh, he asks for forgiveness and uh, apologizes. They also ask for forgiveness and apologize. And they all sort of confirm, I love you, I love you, I love you. That goes on. Now, these are the type of discussions and they in fact prolong life in the hospice. And 
He says that if end of life discussions were an experimental drug, the FDA, that is a drug regulatory body in the United States, uh, would approve it. Because it prolongs life, has no side effects. Whatever side effects are there are all positive. That is uh, growth of love. Now that's a very positive side effect. Spiritual growth, that's a positive side effect. Now here we enter into another area that the legalities of cancer treatment. Why do doctors always uh, try to suggest uh, more and more treatment? Partly it is because if they deny the person some treatment which is still available, then the person can be dragged to the court of law. If this treatment was available, why did, not, why did you not let the patient have the benefit of that treatment? So, so long as some treatment is available, they'll advise that treatment rather than say that nothing can be done. And now, most of the time, there is hardly any situation where nothing can be done. There's always something that can be done and therefore to keep himself on the safe side legally because now medicine you know, is changing its color. The doctor is no longer treated as God. His verdict is not, his can be questioned in the court of law. So uh, the doctors, so long as the treatment is available, the doctor recommends it. The decision lies with you, lies with the patient and the family. But so far the doctor is concerned if the treatment is available, he's bound to offer it. And here is a uh, sort of general uh, sort of statement based on probably interview of a very large number of cancer specialists, which again Atul Gawande has, uh, says in his book, more than 40% of oncologists, more than 40% of, of cancer specialists admit to offering treatments that they believe are unlikely to work. They know the treatment is useless. It's not work. But so long as the treatment is available, they offer it because nobody should be able to say that if this was available, why you did not offer it. That is the legality. Which again brings us to the yoga dharma, that what is legal and what is illegal, what is moral and what is immoral, depends upon many factors and that can change with time. Then looking at cancer in ways more than one, which was the title. You already seen, we have seen it in many ways. Now let us see a few more ways, which are the final sort of a uh, look at cancer. Cancer is generally seen as an enemy, we fought. But is it really a contemptible crook or does it deserve another look, a more charitable look? Is it an enemy to fight or can it be seen in a different light? Now, coming from a cancer patient who is not a doctor, who has written this book, The Joy of Cancer, Nur Kumar, he was not a deeply spiritual person. But then he talks in this book how cancer benefited me. And some of the major points he makes are that as a result of this cancer, I gave up smoking. I learned who my real friends are, true friends are. They just made themselves scarce. The true friends were those who offered genuine help, like say, leaving the car for three months, car and the driver for three months at their disposal. Freed from work alcoholism. He used to work a lot. You know, like, what is the use? I have to have good, better work-life balance. And that's how, once again, found his family. He again became intimate with the family. And as he says, I put in single quotes, became spiritual. Because that's what he says. But uh, there's nothing like becoming spiritual. It's uh, realizing one's spiritual nature. Because basically we are all spiritual beings. And uh, he just discovered that there's more to him than just the body and the mind. There is a deeper self, the true self. That's what he discovered. That's what being becoming spiritual means. So if so much can happen to a person who starts as an ordinary person, not as a deeply spiritual person, then can we really call cancer a crook or an enemy to fight? And of course, we saw those exceptional patients of Bernie Siegel, how they handled cancer in such a way that they got cured after surgery. So that's why he says illness can be a wake-up call. Not every physical illness can be cured. We can, however, make use of all illness to help us redirect our lives. We can become more loving and caring, as we saw. And again, the same person, Bernie Siegel. The greatest gift of all is that we don't live forever. So being mortal, which is the title of uh, Atul Gawande's book, is actually a gift. It's a gift that we have to die. We don't live forever. Otherwise, we would never think of the genuine purpose of life. It's because we know that life is limited. But then nobody expects death. And nobody knows when death will come. It can come suddenly. 
So in a way, cancer patient is lucky. He knows that the certainty which I knew all along but was denying is now a reality for me. I'm not going to live very long. Secondly, it's not going to happen tomorrow. I have a few years more to live, which means I have advanced notice. Let me do what I should, should have been doing all my life. Let me start doing now. And the result is that the spiritual growth that this person can achieve within five or 10 years that this person lives can be more than several decades of ordinary life. Not only he achieves that, his family, his caregivers like doctors and nurses, his relatives and friends can also share in that spiritual growth. And uh, basically spiritual growth comes through love and that is not only the purpose of individual life, that is also what should be happening on the planet as a whole. That's what makes the world a better place to live in. And one of the final conclusions of Bernie Siegel, I believe that we are here to contribute love to the planet. When we are loving, when we become more loving, we increase the amount of love that goes around in the world. That's our basic job. We are here in this earth to contribute love to the planet, each of us in our own way. And some end up doing it to cancer, which is not too bad a way as you've seen, because it gives us not too much time, yet it does give us some time to do what we should be doing. And finally, this quote from Sri Aurobindo on the same lines, that to feel love and oneness is to live. That is what makes life meaningful. What makes life worth living is uh, the feeling of love, which has been inspired by a sense of oneness. Suggested reading. Here are two of the best known uh, paperbacks of Bernie Siegel. They are paperbacks, so they are popular books, but at the same time based on extensive research. Love, Medicine and Miracles, Peace, Love and Healing. These two books, one by a person who has recovered from cancer, Anup Kumar, The Joy of Cancer, and another by another medical doctor, although not a cancer specialist, uh, Atul Gawande, Being Mortal. And uh, this book, again by a medical doctor, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, on death and dying. In this book, again by a medical doctor, Dr. Alok Pandey, a psychiatrist and a devotee of Sri Aurobindo and the mother. The title seems similar, but there is a difference. This is on death and dying. This is death, dying and beyond. Which means that you'll find a lot more spiritual content here because the beyond part, the death is not the end of the story. The journey of the soul continues. So there's a death, there's a dying process of dying, which ends in death, but that is not the end. There is a beyond. My gratitude to some of these major sources, Wikipedia, uh, National Institutes of Health, the Khan Academy, Wiki, and uh, Wikipedia, of course, for many other things. And all this search becomes so easy because of Google. Gratitude to the mother and Sri Aurobindo for making this session possible. Uh, here's our YouTube channel, Yes Spirituality YouTube channel, on which this talk will also be uploaded. And you'll find plenty of other material, previous talks, courses, music, lots of material which you may find interesting. Uh, if you have any questions or comments for which there may not be much time today, because already it has been a very long session, uh, you can always write us on this email address, yes at yesspirituality.com. Thank you all for being there. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot for this very comprehensive session. Although you mentioned you are not an expert, but it didn't seem so. Thanks a lot for your research and deep insights. Uh, we do have a question in the chat box. Uh, okay. During the session, we got it. Would you like to take it? Sir? Sure. I will read it out. So, uh, Samir says, Namaste, Dr. Bijlani. Thank you so much. Recently saw a book that asserts cancer is genetic, is a myth. Dr. Thomas Seyfried says it misled researchers. For him, it's a mitochondrial metabolic disorder. He talks experiments. They took nucleus from tumor cell and fertilized in new good cytoplasm and found it had no trace of cancer on growing etc 
So uh, one question he has, why great souls like Ramakrishna Paramhans, Golwalkar, Guruji died of cancers? Knowing their biographies puzzled me why their saintly and spiritual strength didn't help cure cancer. Well, I mean, there are two different questions. One is related to the biology of cancer. That is, uh, uh, whether cancer is genetic or not. Now, this is a little vague in the sense that cancer is not primarily a hereditary disease. That is true. But uh, when it comes to the mitochondrial uh, malfunction, that could be one of the associations, the end result of which could be a failure of the uh, normal error correction mechanisms. It could be a failure of the tumor suppressor genes to function properly. So one set of research does not necessarily prove that all the other previous research was wrong. What it does is that the previous research raises some questions and it tries to answer those questions. One might ask, why do the genes behave like that? Why do the tumor suppressor, tumor suppressor genes become weak? Why is it that the oncogenes get an upper hand? Now, that is a question. Now, if you go into that, you find that that is what's because of mitochondrial malfunction. But then you'll ask, why was mitochondrial malfunction there? Which means another piece of research. So that's how research keep going, keeps going back. And finally, you reach a stage when you say, beyond this, I don't know. That always happens in research. But then that's how you move one step at a time in research. And the second question was, why did Sri Ramakrishna get it? As I said repeatedly, there is no guarantee that a person of a particular type, even if he's a very nice person, even if he's a rishi like Sri Ramakrishna, that he will not get it. What distinguishes these people, if they are people at all, they are maybe avatars, but what distinguishes them from uh, an ordinary person, ordinary mortals like me, is that uh, when they get the disease, the disease is there, but they don't suffer. For example, Sri Ramakrishna had throat cancer and he was advised not to speak. He said, well, the purpose of my life is served by speaking. So I'll go on speaking. I don't care when I die and I'm not suffering. So the disease is there. Pain is also there, but they don't suffer. Any other question? Thank you, sir. No, no other question, yes, sir. Thanks a lot for answering that and for your valuable time, of course, and your deep wisdom. I thank the participants for being with us today. We can close today's session with a moment of peaceful silence. Namaste. Namaste.